first of all uh, we i invite uh, we invite professor prasun bhattacharya he is a living legend of uh, arsenic and geogenic uh, uh, the concern of water and uh, till that uh, i i salute his curiosity that with which he is keep working every day he wake up with new energy and that, that the a new passion for learning new thing um in short he is uh, the editor in chief of groundwater of sustainable development of ildebier he has been associate editor of uh, journal of hydrology he has uh, worked a lot in bangladesh on the arsenic and uh, he has more than i mean the 5000 citations to his uh, credit um so with uh, little because i uh, the i would like to invite professor bhattacharya for his 5 to 10 minutes okay yes. manish thank you well i mean i don't really think about citations anymore it's about 12700 something Yeah, I was surprised. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know how it is geometric progression. Yeah. You know, it's geometrically it increases. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, something which I'm going to talk today, I mean, something beyond arsenic, because we have been I've been working on arsenic for quite a long time, and I also started actually my career at KTH working on fluoride in India. That too. So that both the things. So what I'm now focusing in a more integrated manner, which calls for drinking water safety. we just planning and and something i'll be talking about digitalization and thought about catching up with your 5c concept on water vulnerability so i think we are catching many of these things together except for one thing like except climate change i think i'm not touching that to that extent so okay i'll before i'll be going without giving any further introduction i'll just talk about the basic concept of water safety i think david has really ex exceptionally started off the last session with these the details but i'm i'm not going to deal with most of those things which is already talked but i'm more concerned here about how do we really ensure the sustainable supply of safe or acceptable drinking water and this effectively can be achieved through a risk management approach so it is actually uh, uh, the knowledge about the catchment areas and the source water quality and this is also inspired through the swedish way of um, ensuring the drinking water safe safety so what we are actually doing about protecting our catchments water protection areas demark demarcating them so that we do not really try to indulge into any activities which will eventually lead to water ground water contamination in general so catchment quality which governs the source water quality treatment control and then finally protection of the distribution system that also we have seen and there also we need to see what are the specific uh, parameters which need to be looked into so actually the risk management approach is the the, the only probable solution so that we can give a more comprehensive drinking water safety from the catchment to the consumer so a bit more cross say i'm going into much further details it's water sources treatment innovations where we have already manish you talked about environmental engineering solutions and also similar distribution set with distribution system because what sort of what whatsoever treatment you do unless your distribution system is not clean or actually recontaminating them so that is one of the major concern and this is actually inspired to the who um, uh, drinking water safety man plan manual which is actually uh, governing these different things so here accessing water quality links to your links to climate change impacts availability accessibility this source i mean distance from the source quantity ecological safety and risk assessment where we are talking about and manish had already given some of these presentations i was in in ahmedabad in 2018 so i am now trick taking it from a different angle so system assessment approach is one thing which is very important from the source to the tap again i am repeating that meets and then simultaneously to that we need to monitor the health based water quality targets so that and then where and we need to identify different control measures where it is wrong is is there any any mistake in the problem in the system or in the operational or monitoring so we need to bring up all these three 
items into our management plan. So what we really see now is that we have the framework for safe drinking water. This is from WHO 2005. 15 years back, this framework has been done, but how we rationally talk about it, how do we really discuss about it? We have not yet uh, seen much of the discussions on these. We have, well, we know that health-based targets, we have drinking water guidelines revised as late as 2017, the last value, but we have also some sort of system assessment tools. We are actually, we are awake now that we are talking about system assessment but still what we are lacking is monitoring. And this is primarily because most of this monitoring is manually handled and we don't have effective monitoring tools. Like we need digital sensors. We need management and communication that too also with the money issue had talked about mobile telephones and things right now. So that has eased. So we need this management and communication. So it is getting, slowly it is getting uh, lighter in the red cross. So it is coming up. And with, together with that, we have the surveillance system, but still this surveillance is not coupled with the health-based target. So that's the lacuna which we have right now. Now, given me the assignment of talking about geogenic contaminants, we have the natural geogenic contaminants in our sources. So we, it, it actually affects the huge, the entire spectrum of our living world or the world. So we have different chemical elements, geological setting which govern, which it perhaps will be talking more about the things in different type of geological settings, water quality assessments, very sporadic and very time. It's not mon con monitored continuously. So if we evidence of potential impacts on other compartments as you see over here, and then principal geology, geogenic contaminants which are on the SDG priority list, fluoride, arsenic, and partly what, what we really do not discuss is salinity. But salinity is also equally important for uh, uh, for our well-being, especially the blood pressure and and the cardiovascular system, which is really affected. And radionuclides, of course, uranium, because we are living in Sweden, we are on a hard rock terrain, on granitic terrains, so where we have these radionuclides, radon, and to some extent, even manganese is 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 a, is a major problem. Of course, I'm not naming iron, which is also there. So, so now we have also worked on the harmonized approach. What we mean here is that we need to link up, think about the system. We have been talking about different policy, but what steers that policy? Who has made that policy? And how we as a researcher are really integrated with the policy? And have we really looked into what are the policies before we start implementing our different methods or different, different sorts of interventions, what we do. So we have not, so through this project, which we are currently doing with UNICEF, we got an opportunity to work with the policies, which means the review of different policies and protocols. This is again in the Bangladesh context, but this can be scaled up globally for each country. So we need to understand the current existing policies, wherever you are starting to work, then, de then develop the context of technology specific strategies, protocols, how do we really integrate? And the second one is who all are the actors here? Like for example, in country like India, Bangladesh, where the local drillers actually carry out, this is a one field where there is so-called informal sector is operating to, to ensure the drinking water safety or provision of water supply. So how do we integrate in this approach? And then we need to have the capacity enhancement in the categories where we need to have hand in from the appropriate tools for direct intervention or monitoring or at least which gives us an idea of these how do how do these local uh, informal sector can be can be empowered with new tools and new directives and new directions and finally our hydrogeology that's manish you taught, also talked about our hydrogeological investigations, and that's again come. Now, what add-on we need to do? We need to add on with real-time mapping. And that is new. Nothing is new. I mean, those things are new. How we really adapt to digital technology in all our interventions. So this is an example what we, UNICEF, we have been working with UNICEF Bangladesh to create arsenic safe village and also arsenic safe communities. And here we integrate also with hygiene promotion because no water, no hygiene. 
simple and good quality water of course hygiene is not only sanitation hygiene is also our our hand washing techniques and so much. so uh, the thing is also linked with covid because we talked about promote hand washing for covid um, to prevent the, the disease spreading so what we really need to bring up is a digital applications for capacity building of different actors it can be local drillers it can be the national uh, technocrats so on and so forth so this is one of the one of the slides which i really like most and this i've been working on then about the drinking water policy framework in general it's water safety legislative and policy framework and from where we are actually trying to do we have the acts policies strategies and different plans and guidelines it follows from from the parliamentary part to to the different policy sectors for them setting the guidelines and guidelines and policies for water supply sanitation so on and so forth for example now for example in india we have seen the first water policy which came out was in 1987 and that's the first time when this will be talked about in this national water policy so it's it's a, and then in the article 1.7 it talks about another important aspect is water quality it is they didn't say that it is the important aspect so so that's the approach towards that and then 2002 just as a follow up 12 years and in this policy they started talking about water resource planning when they how this should be planned how this should be really implemented into different uh, identified in different hydrological units in a, in a drainage basin or a sub basin or or even looking into a multi sectoral manner and then the third one water allocation priorities in the prior in the previous bible summit we had partly discussed about drinking water when we talk about drinking water we always mix our attitude and try to shy away from the drinking water perspective because drinking water movement is, is of paramount importance because we need still 6.5 billion people who would have a, a lack of appropriate or improved drinking water uh, provisions the drinking water irrigation and thirdly ecology if we talk about the urban water scenario we also need ecological implications and then finally agro industries and irrigations so how does they address this is drinking water is addressed by should be provided to the entire population both urban and rural areas that was this paragraph which they talked about drinking water and now in 12 2012 of just after 10 years there's the latest one with late late one which is national water policy 2012 when they have tried to talk about water framework law in india just like the water framework directive in the european union from 1998 which was started which was coined so there was a need to evolve a national framework law for for the for, which covers the general principles of different legislative and executive powers of the center states and local governing institutions who are actually working but still it it needs to be quite visited more and then right now this national framework bill which talks about many of the aspects here it's a, it's a multi um, uh, multi chaptered document which is still a draft which i think we have as a scientist we have had quite significant role to play how do we really design this thing further for our thing so where we in article 19 it should preservation of water quality article 19 so this here is we are talked about recycling and reuse water it is there already so how do we really implement these things this framework bill into action putting the bill into action so that's a perfect match of what you have been saying manish does really thank you for highlighting these aspects which has been already covered in the national framework bill so anyway besides that we had this india has already the swachh bharat mission which was one of the directives which we have already talked about and then together with that we had national rural drinking water program this also adequately so now in order to implement this we need to have these four pillars we have governance leadership thing we need the capacity empowerments and then technology innovations and then principles and standards so so these are the important components which we need to discuss and the the, the most star was this the what do you call flag stuff mission now the jal jeevan mission and how do we really achieve this is it achievable har ghar jal and that's something which we again need i'm repeating this diagram again we need to introduce reintroduce this will to get into it where we can do the system strengthening how we can ma manipulate different water points 
over the identify the different actors for water service, water services, certification, even tubewell water insurance. But if you have a qualified driller, you can have insurance. So for to make a solution, we are now working on this Arsmita's digital water platform, which is one of the tools which is linked up for safe groundwater mapping, even drill, driller mapping and different project mapping, a safe aquifer basin mapping on SASMIT principles. SASMIT is not only sustainable arsenic mitigation, but it's a philosophy of safe drinking water access, data visualize, visualization, and that's what accelerates the path to achieve the SDG goal. Some of the examples of Asmitas in action in the field right now, we are undergoing working with the Bangladesh UNICEF project where we are do documenting the lithologs in, in the field. And this is a way now currently we are collecting the information on cloud based on the- So the now plastic. we have to conclude. And, and I, I'm, I'm almost done with it and some of these field actions and how do we do this documentation so that these information are not only on papers, but these are actually cloud-based solutions which can be approached to, to the policymakers up to the visualization step. What we see here that you see the groundwater arsenic concentration or any chemical contaminant to reduce the cost. So I think with that, but I again, this is an important slide to show the eighth international Congress where we'll be decide discussing more in Netherlands in June. So we would welcome and encourage all of you to join this Congress in Netherlands. Thank you. Definitely. Um, so moving uh, to the next, because uh, of course we will have come back to the question, uh, I yes. mean the uh, discussion. But of course, uh, what I can say is that you have not stopped. This Sasmit is going to go big way. Uh, you have so many dreams that is very visible here, are evident here. Um, let me invite uh, the scientist under limelight at, at present, uh, <laughs> the <laughs> Professor Mukherjee. Uh, the, he, because uh, he has owned the most coveted, uh, the Santi Sarup, uh, Nagar Ebad, which is a kind of uh, Indian novel. Uh, actually, I am saying this to David. Um, and uh, so he has, um, um, yeah, and uh, he is one of the well-known hydrogeologists. And uh, with that uh, stamp, uh, he stands uh, among stalwarts of the country. Um, and uh, I congratulate him once again, although uh, the, because, uh, and uh, that leads to the several other things. Uh, I'm sorry, um, Avijit, I would not like to read anything else uh, on your introduction. Uh, so please go ahead. You have seven minutes, okay. seven to 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, just give us uh, the, your experience and saying that where we should go. Right. Okay, uh, a, a very good evening to uh, Manish, David, uh, Pashunda, and uh, Dipangata. Uh, it's my, you know, real privilege to be here today and, you know, talking among all the experts. Um, so I was not exactly sure, like, what to talk about um, and really, you know, prepared this slide in a hurry. Um, but I think, like, it's uh, quite apt uh, to, like, what Pashun uh, Patasaria just ended at and what Manish had been talking earlier. Uh, rather than talking about the policies and uh, the engineering part, I'll rather talk about the geology part, you know, the hydrogeology, which is kind of my background anyway. Uh, so let me share my slides. Is my slide visible? Manish, is my slide visible? No, not yet. Not yet, okay. Yeah, yeah, now. No, uh, is, is it coming? Out? Yeah. Okay. So, so what I'll, I'll talk about is uh, groundwater geogenic contaminants and uh, where do they occur, why, and what are they? So uh, as uh, you know, we have been repeatedly mentioning about that uh, one of the reasons that many of us you know, in our own capacity or in conjunction are working on um, water at as large and groundwater for sure uh, is to achieve the uh, the UN SDG number six, which talks about access to clean water and sanitation for all. And while there are different measures and different methods by which we can access clean water, but one of the things that uh, you know, various forums have definitely agreed upon that um, groundwater, which is one of the most principal source of uh, drinking water across the world, needs to be safe from geogenic contaminants. 
So in this talk, uh, I would I would kind of stick to what what do we mean by geogenic contaminants and how do we get them in water and what is the Indian scenario, you know, pretty vaguely. So you know, again, I'm coming from a more classical hydrogeoscience perspective, and I'm 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 showing you. Uh, what we call the traditional 2D view of the groundwater flow and reactions in a unit basin aquifer, where you know you have a recharge and you have a discharge. That's pretty much uh, most of us would get to see at. However, in the subsurface, there are various other hydrogeological processes. We call them geochemic hydrogeochemical evolution. And in these processes, the recharge water would move toward the discharge front as it goes through you know, either um, local scale to regional scale flow system, but it will chemically evolve as it goes through. And in this process, they would go through the process called aquifer matrix and groundwater interactions. And this is where the geogenic contaminants comes into play for groundwater, for sure. So, you know, I've given the example of arsenic here. So arsenic five can get liberated through this interaction in an oxidizing environment and arsenic-3 would get liberated in a reducing environment. And in certain conditions, they can coexist also. So this process is what we hydrogeologists try to understand in a big deal. Uh, you know, we can monitor the water, we can understand like what the research and the research is doing, but unless we understand the interaction of the rocks or the sediments with the residing water or the water that is being in residence, groundwater in residence, uh, in, in specific time frame, we are not going to understand what causes the pollution. Now, of course, you know, in a changing world, we also have other things like climate change. We also do have human practices as well as policy intervention and in various level, which can catalyze this process to various scales. However, you need to have the basic understanding or the basic, uh, you know, uh, interaction processes happening for any of these uh, to be you know, taking in place. Now, one thing which is least talked about is the presence of a lake or a playa. And in, in various conditions, we, we have seen that these lakes <laughs> or playas act as local scale fo uh, focused research points. And many a times these playas or lakes can introduce different kinds of solutes, including the contaminants, which can actually catalyze these reactions in various level. So, you know, we have worked with in Argentina, you know, of course with Prashanda, and uh, of course we, we have worked in the high, high plains of the, uh, of the Himalayas, where we have seen repeatedly that the presence of these lakes or the pliers, um, either salinas or, you know, just freshwater lakes, they can introduce solutes in the subsurface. And these solutes can or would liberate contaminants from the solid phase to the uh, groundwater phase. Now, what I'll do in the next few slides is to quickly uh, take you through a tour of the global uh, extent of the geogenic contaminants. So the first slide I'm showing you, which is a combination of all the previous authors along with a publication that we very recently had in the book called Global Groundwater, uh, where I show you the extent of uh, geogenic arsenic across the world. And as you would see that uh, they are not in, only in South Asia, but they are present in you know, large proportion uh, you know, in terms of the terrestrial land, both in North America and South America, also in other smaller locations in Africa, Europe, and <clears throat> Australia. Fluoride, let's talk about, but possibly have a much larger extent um, than arsenic. And fluoride is present in a big way in North America and South America, as well as in other places uh, in Asia and so on. And then selenium and uranium. Now they are, you know, they are present in a much lesser extent. However, you know, it's also important to understand their presence. And salinity. Prashantaracharya mentioned about salinity. Now I'm not sure whether I should call salinity a pollutant or a contaminant, or it is a trigger for the contaminants. But that's something we can debate on later. The reason I showed you all these, um, you know, global maps is to stress that the presence of these geogenic contaminants in all these locations, as you would see, is not just a coincidence. And I, 
you know, like working with my colleagues uh, in various levels, we have thought about that these occurrences or these patterns, spatial patterns that we observe is not exactly something, you know, that fell from the sky or it's just, you know, it's just a, a like a coincidence that it occurs in one place versus the other. And to do that, we started to work on the arsenic and to understand a larger geologic framework for the existence of the arsenic in a global scale. So I take you back to the map that I showed you on the arsenic and um, uh, just you know, look at this map and then the look next map. And what I show you that how the geogenic arsenic that I showed you in the previous map, uh, you can literally superimpose uh, the geologic patterns, the tectonic patterns uh, across the world to be connected to the existence of these arsenic prone areas in the in groundwater, which tells us that uh, tectonics or larger scale geologic processes have a huge control, at least on the primary existence of the groundwater arsenic across the globe. And to my understanding as a geologist, I would think that similar event or similar occurrences do happen for all the other contaminants that I talked about. Now, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate uh, Monish talking about the co-occurrence of uh, such several other contaminants to be there. And I think the co-occurrence or, you know, single occurrence, they are kind of picked on or linked on the type of aquifers that do exist. For example, like arsenic can occur in, uh, with fluoride. I, I don't, don't disagree on that, but the redox state of the arsenic has to be matching with the fluoride because redox is one of the primary control factors for the liberation of many of these pollutants in the subsurface. So that way, selenate, vanadate, molybdate, uranate, they would coexist. No worries on that. And presence of salinity would actually increase the possibility of those occurrences. So coming to India, and I'm, I'm sure like many people have talked about the you know, the pollution problem in India, because it's in the limelight, since it's one of the groundwater wise, it's one of the largest user in the world, as well as people, you know, suffering from a, a different types of groundwater pollution across the country. But again, I, I really insist that we need to keep the geologic architecture, the hydrogeology in context while understanding the distribution of the geogenic pollutants. So the map on the left, it's a simplified map of the heterogeneous aquifers of groundwater distribution in the Indian subcontinent. That is India and its seven neighbors. And what you see as the bright blue, the Indus Ganges Brahmaputra Basin, it is the primary football of South Asia, as well as it is a primary aquifer system of South Asia. It's one of the largest in the world, for sure. And more than you know, 500 million people, or maybe even more, are just sustaining on the groundwater in, in this basin because it's one of the largest aquifer system in the world. But at the same time, the presence of the pollutants, the geogenic pollutants in the same aquifers actually have jeopardized the life of these people who are depending on the groundwater system of the IGB basin. And <clears throat> that is the natural cause. Over and over again, we have showed um, that if, you know, geology is the main culprit, human interference is, is the second, you know, second best uh, culprit. And we have definitely proved, or I would say at least numerically proved that human interferences in terms of pumping have actually aggravated the problem in an in a extent that we, we observe today. So I'm showing you an example that we published in 2011 where in a, in a model study area, uh, in a part of the uh, highly populated Bengal basin, we, we simulated the flow of the arsenic in a, in a localized system, control system, field system, where we have a lot of field control and it's a field laboratory actually. And we showed that an arsenic particle, which would take about 250 years to, to reach a target well, can reach within five years if the pumping is going on at the rate that we observe in the field. So things can get extremely highly catalyzed by human interferences. Um, and so is fluoride. So if that was arsenic, fluoride is also present, very localized 
in certain locations, again, connected to the geology. And, you know, you would see like there are clusters in the western part, clusters in the eastern part, you know, southeastern part, and some clusters in the northeastern parts. I, I can, again, I have not done the study per se, but from my knowledge of the geology of the area, I can tell you, you know, blindly that these are areas which are, you know, prone to, uh, you know, silicate weathering in the Vedo zone. And this is how a fluoride would be, you know, transmitted to groundwater. So what we are doing now? Well, uh, Prashun Bhattacharya mentioned about the Jaljivan mission. It is one of the premier missions of the present Indian government. And uh, Dr. Shah knows about this very well. He possibly would be talking some parts of it. So we have been working with uh, Dr. Shah's group, uh, Prashun Bhattacharya's group and others. And over the years, uh, also working with uh, data scientists, like mostly AI people and uh, big data analytics people, along with people in the human and social science groups, we have transformed this big data to analytics to decision making. And we are trying to understand based on the information that are mm -hmm. available to how to understand the geologic problem of the geogenic contaminants. So I'm, I'm showing you the last slide where very recently we published, not even a month, um, the extent of groundwater arsenic across India based on 2.7 million groundwater measurements that are archived in the Jaljivan mission database and how uh, you know, we, we can estimate the number of people <clears throat> would be under threat, which varies from very conservative estimate of about 90 million to uh, more um, on the high side of 270 million people drinking groundwater, I mean, ars high arsenic groundwater uh, as drinking water in this region. So I'll stop it here and would be happy to take any question now or at the end. Thank you. Everybody is keeping time. That's very good news. So this uh, today's uh, talk has started uh, from Dr. Rakesh Kumar, and I wanted the aptly uh, the supportive at the end. So this is uh, last but not the least. Uh, the our uh, speaker of the day is Dr. Dipankar Saha. Actually, uh, he brings a different perspective because he has been implementing a sort of yeah, the. He, he retired as a uh, the secretary, a paper secretary from uh, Central Groundwater Board. And so they have the mandate uh, to explore and implement or take care of the, the groundwater resources rather than researching like us. Um, and uh, mm, raising another questions and another one. But he has, he has been always a researcher at the core of his heart. And uh, that made him present uh, 100, more than 100 keynote addresses. And that's why he has been called. And uh, I think one of the most, uh, uh, the, a kind of, if, if there will be one person to be uh, connecting link, like uh, between researcher and uh, the government agency people, he will be the best suited person in the water. Uh, he was uh, the member of uh, Indo-UK Water Security Exchange of Indian Delegation Part. So that is, it means he was also aptly uh, suitable for this one. He has been also part of the delegation that went to Myanmar. Um, he has got National um, Geoscience Award in 2010, which uh, Abhijit has also got in 2014, because I don't want to <laughs> say later he would say, I also got, yeah, you got. And uh, I never applied, of course, I am going to <laughs> But uh, the, uh, so without any, just because this is the last and uh, our audience, uh, I just tried to make it uh, this one. And uh, he is our uh, secretary at uh, National Indian uh, Chapter of IHS. Uh, so with this introduction, Dr. Saha, floor is worse and uh, maximum okay. seven to eight, uh, 10 minutes. Next. Thank you. Uh, I, will, I will maybe take even less time. Uh, you know, uh, first of all, I uh, thanks for inviting me to share the dais with all stalwarts like you. Uh, in front of all of you, I am like a barefoot hydrogeologist, you can say, who roams around here and there in the field. But obviously, uh, some information we also gather uh, from the field and as well as uh, through interaction with luminaries like you, we try to understand the theoretical aspect also. And uh, uh, Dr. David, Dr. Prasoon, Dr. Ovijit, and Dr. Manish, and many others are there. Uh, uh, thanks to all of you that you are hearing me. 
Uh, I will, I, first of all, I apologize that I don't have any formal slides, uh, uh, but I will try to highlight some issues that are, I would say that practical issues related to uh, water in India, groundwater in India, quality in India. And uh, hello. Yeah, yeah, we are hearing you Achoo, loud and clear. I don't know, some problem is there in, with, the, uh, with the internet link here. Anyway. No, no, no. I will call you. If there will be any problem, I will text you. Okay. So uh, the, I will try to highlight some certain issues related to policies and beyond policy implementation issue. Uh, say the geogenic contamination is a real threat in India. And uh, I will tell uh, with some my little experience that we also talk about uh, anthropogenic contamination, but geogenic contamination is very, very wide and pervasive. And except nitrate and pesticide, I will tell, if you consider uh, nitrate, and if you consider that it's an anthropogenic uh, uh, pollution, uh, though there are uh, argument that nitrates is also coming in certain areas from the geological formations, but except nitrate or pesticides, the geologic, uh, geogenic contamination is pervasive and the, I would say the star of the geogenic contamination is obviously arsenic and then also come fluoride. And uh, the arsenic problem with the executing agencies in India, like the water supply department, and say also with Central Groundwater Board who deals with the drinking water supply, the problem compounded when suddenly I would say, uh, though there was a lot of discussion, but I would say not enough discussion, frankly speaking, that we have brought down the limit of arsenic from 50 ppb to 10 ppb. And it was uh, really a, I would say nightmare to many water supply agencies uh, uh, in, the, in the state government, as well as in the government of India in the execution level. Now the, say in arsenic, uh, then comes obviously fluoride. It's uh, widely distributed in, uh, uh, in many length and breadth of India and in different rock types. And our previous idea that the arsenic contamination is mainly in the Indo-Gangetic plain, Brahmaputra plain, obviously it is there. But now the arsenic contamination is reported from hard rock areas also across the length and breadth like in fluoride. And very interesting part is that uh, about a month back, I was interacting with the uh, water supply agencies of the Punjab and Haryana. And interestingly, our previous idea that the arsenic contamination is mostly confined in the shallow aquifers. Uh, that's why the idea has come that you should tap the deeper arsenic free aquifer for water supply uh, that is happening in the in the state of West Bengal to some extent, but mostly in the state of Bihar and Uttar Pradesh, uh, that the arsenic free deeper aquifer are being tapped for community scale water supply through deep tube well, properly designed and properly constructed deep tube well. But in Punjab and Haryana, a new thing is emerging about the arsenic contamination that in the deeper aquifers, they are also getting arsenic contamination at 150 meter or even 200 meter below ground. But I would say frankly that data is, uh, there is a positive in data, data is not enough available, but it's the experience the, the water supply engineers they were telling. So that is another issue that is coming on from uh, arsenic contamination. And uh, then in fluoride contamination, obviously in the contaminated area, when we go for uh, 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 fluoride free water supply, then we uh, typically depend on uh, fluoride removal plants or fluoride removal techniques. But that experience tells that the performance of the fluoride removal in, uh, 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 techniques or when they are installed and uh, used in, a, uh, in, the, in the villages by the communities, they are not properly used and neglected and ultimately uh, people go back to the fluoride contaminated wells even. So these are the, uh, the issues with arsenic and uh, fluoride contamination. And in arsenic fluoride contamination, in, I will try to highlight uh, one issue that always we are thinking that the drinking is the, uh, is the main pathway for ingestion of this 
uh, contaminants. But you see, if you see the groundwater extraction of India, uh, the, it's about say, you can say 250 billion cubic meter. We are the largest extractor of groundwater in the world. And 90% of the groundwater is being used for irrigation. If we consider that the shallow aquifers in the Indo-Gangetic plain, or say in the Southern India, Peninsular India, they are contaminated with arsenic. Large areas are contaminated with arsenic. Then that contaminated arsenic water is also used for irrigation, for food grain production, for dairy production, for horticulture, everywhere. So how to uh, tackle these issues? I uh, am say a little bit linked with the, uh, the new water policy that is being drafted uh, under government of India in Ministry of uh, uh, Water Resource, now Ministry of Jal Shakti. There prolonged discussions are being held on water quality and everybody accepts that though there was a mention about the water quality issue in the water policies of India, but government of India and also the state government has taken less attention to the quality issues. For the first time, I would say that in the replenishable resource assessment that is being done by Central Groundwater Board and all the state government together, and which is the benchmark for all groundwater related policy implementation in India, the replenishable water resource assessment. For the first time, the along with the water volume issues. I mean, when we discuss about the water issues or groundwater issues, we are obsessed with the volumetric assessment. I mean, where the water supply, but we give less attention in the quality issues, but it is good sign that the state government and the government of India is giving uh, attention to the uh, quality issues. But in the quality issues, it's a big gray area, I will tell still that what to do with the agriculture and groundwater, particularly the contaminated groundwater. And most of the Indo-Gangetic plain and the southern part of India, the agriculture is dependent on uh, shallow groundwater, which are arsenic contaminated, fluoride contaminated, and contaminated with other uh, parameters also. Then I would uh, also uh, uh, try to highlight uh, the one or two issues that Professor uh, Prasoon was telling about the salinity. With my experience, you see post superannuation, I am working here and there, uh, the salinity uh, problem is coming up hugely in India. The primary reason is the overexploitation of groundwater. There is overexploitation of groundwater. There is rapid decline of water level. So we are digging our well deeper and deeper. Maybe we are taking out older and older groundwater and older groundwater are supposedly laden with higher minerals and higher uh, TDS. You see, uh, I worked uh, extensively in Gujarat in last year and this year, I am working in, uh, in the Indo-Gangetic Plains in different parts. And recently, uh, I have been invited to uh, contribute in water supply of the, of the urban agglomeration about Delhi. And you will not believe the, uh, the issue rather than shortage of water is quality of water. Like if you go to the, say, the, the Gurgaon, the bustling uh, urban area beside Delhi, if you go to Noida, the, it's a huge urban area that is coming up. There, maybe the water level is going down. Still, the aquifers are good. Say, if you go to the Noida urban area, just on the other side of Jamuna, in uh, Delhi, uh, I would say national capital region, the aquifers are good. The aquifers are deep, thick, prolific. A lot of groundwater is there. But the shallow groundwater, which is a thin layer, I would say, maybe 50 to 60 meter thin layer floating above the saline groundwater that is already uh, almost finished up. It is finished up in Gurgaon. It is getting finished up in Noida. So there is an upwelling of the saline groundwater uh, and the, they are really, really worried. Now, if you tell, if you argue that the, 
that the salinity all is not as lethal as arsenic or not as lethal as fluoride but there is another point if salinity is there the consumer get agitated there is flurry of complaints there is a flurry of court cases complain to ngt also so the government is has also to take attention to the salinity also which is rising and say in in the gujarat if you go to uh, karnataka if you go to telangana in hard rock area in semi consolidated areas in the alluvial areas as the over exploitation is increasing water level is going down the salinity problem is increasing and it is uh, it is maybe uh, government has to take a, uh, a a concerned view about the rising uh, salinity of groundwater uh, in india now uh, coming to the uh, my last uh, few words about the uh, about the uh, about the arse uh, matlab the geogenic contaminated or contaminated areas i would say uh, one opinion was there there is a lack of monitoring i would say that the besides monitoring the major problem that faces when you execute a Uh, a a project in the contaminated areas may be a contaminated free well contaminated free water supply may be uh, ex situ treatment plant i would say the major problem is maintenance in our typical indian system we always believe in launching a project in constructing a project but less attention in the maintenance it is happening with our artificial recharge endeavors it is happening same thing is happening with our rainwater harvesting and ever and same thing is happening with our uh, contamination free water supply and ever wherever there is uh, geogenic contamination or even anthropogenic contamination so uh, my argument with the with the drafting committee of the recent water policy that is going on that uh, give proper attention to maintenance keep proper funding to maintenance uh, there is a there are argument uh, debate is going on whether we should uh fund the uh, we should price the water for uh, uh the contaminated free water there should be pricing from where the fund from the maintenance will come but uh, the water is a very very politically sensitive uh, issue in india and day by day i would say i, I would tell that it is becoming more and more politically touchy and particularly the ground water uh, so the maintenance issue we have to see and i at the end i will say that the uh, government of india the state government also they are at last uh, taking a view that the uh, policy and uh, the, the water quality is as a, as a serious menace as uh, menace as water uh, resource volumetric crunch so lot of attention is being uh, uh, given but there should be a bridge between lot of good research is going on there should be a bridge between the research and the practical implication and at the same time huge capacity building is needed in the state department and in the central government department because the there are uh, experts in the government departments executing agencies but they are more on in the supply side in supplying the water less uh, knowledge less capacity how to, on how to deal the Uh, quality issues so with this few words uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity uh, actually you finished the panel discussion uh, because you have touched all those issues that were uh, uh, being asked but nevertheless i would uh, give uh, the floor to david uh, being as uh, to moderate the session and close the session followed by which um, palguni will uh, give vote of thanks for the day and then uh, we will wrap so maybe 5 to 10 minutes is enough to, uh, for now <clears throat> yeah i agree let's try and bring it to a close maybe in 5 uh, or 10 minutes but does anybody have questions for the panel here either via the chat or by speaking up so there are some questions already you can uh, see in the q and a uh, david can you go and see in the q and a yeah i mean some might be from previous 
uh, no, no, no. So some, something about citizen yeah, accessibility map. and yeah, gray water and some ask about the, some few things. Yeah, and uh, I think Bine is, uh, has been, he is the panelist for tomorrow, but he has been kindly being online for the entire session, all four sessions. So Bine, if you can switch on your, and Tanusri also, Falguni also, please come uh, alive if you are there or not <laughs> attending. Okay. Anyhow, maybe I, I ask my colleagues a question yeah. that I'm really interested in. With salinity, obviously, uh, you know, it's a taste issue, but can it not also be a health issue? Because we did some work in Dar es Salaam and, and uh, the level of salinity of some of the borehole water that people are drinking is really amazingly high. And one of my colleagues, he noticed that there's a high stroke rate in, in that city. You know, that could be for various reasons, but I mean, do we think that salinity is more than a taste issue? Could it be a health issue as well, if this is being drunk uh, for, you know, daily? Did anyone want to? Can I just add one point about salinity? Because there has been some study in Bangladesh, especially in the coastal waters, uh, there, there was a, there's a group from, I don't remember this, the, the name, I'm just not recollecting the name. So, but they are actually trying to look into the exposure to the intake of sodium chloride. I mean, if you see the see salinity as a function of sodium and chloride. So what are the exposure pathway? What is one is the, from the water sources. And then we also have regular intake of sodium chloride through food. So if you think in terms of daily dose, of sodium chloride, it exceeds much more than what is required. And that obviously calls for a <clears throat> severe health concern. Because in Sweden, you know, in restaurants, there is a guideline for application of salt in restaurant foods. So there is a guideline for that, how much salt can be used for preparing the foods so that you don't miss that delicate balance of. So I think that is one important aspect. Of. And then secondly, what uh, Obijit and even Dipankurta mentioned about deep groundwater, which which have which is not only arsenic or fluoride. I mean, you, the mainly it's concern about the high EC values, and it, it is something which can be easily monitored if you have an EC meter on it, so you can really see that how how the salinity is changing. So if it is changing, then you can adapt to managed aquifer recharge to bring down that. So you can actually control this excess salt water through minor interventions. To what extent? I mean, this um, um, Dutch project which Professor Motinam is doing in Bangladesh, together with so they are actually looking into these aspects. Perhaps Obijit, you can highlight a bit more yeah. on your experience. So, so I would possibly talk a bit on like uh, just not the very obvious uh, impacts of salinity, which is of course the health effects, but possibly a more passive impact in terms of changing the water chemistry itself, and uh, you know very obviously salinity would you know, uh, change the pH of the water to begin with, as well as it will also change the other biogeochemical parameters. And you know, in conjunction with other parameters, uh, salinity can actually act as a, uh, a very strong catalyst for mobilization of other contaminants, including arsenic and fluoride. So I, I had a chance to work in the Texas High Plains where you know, there is a lot of salinity issues uh, not directly from you know, natural sources, but mostly from the petroleum industry. And when the, the blinds are discharged, they are a nuisance to the environment. And some of these blinds would repercolate back to the groundwater, the drinking water aquifers, uh, the drinking water source aquifers. And uh, we, we had like huge projects, which would just target to understand how the salinity is introduced to the system and how salinity is actually changing you know, changing forever the water chemistry of those drinking water aquifers. So, so it is, to my understanding, rather than a direct effect, the indirect effect is much more pervasive and much more, you know, for a longer period of time. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I think there was a question on uranium yeah, yeah. as well. Can you give insight on uranium as a groundwater? 
and permanent. Anyone? Sorry. Could you please repeat the question, please? What's about uranium as a contaminant? Yeah. yeah. I think uranium, if we consider in, in groundwater, we, in Sweden, of course, we have, this is one of the potential element of concern in our groundwaters, which actually, it's a problem for private wells. Not the municipal supplied wells, but private wells which are actually getting. But that is also a function of what are the other macronutrients in the water. Like we also have a group who is actually working drinking water, mineral balance in drinking water. So that's how the how the calcium intake circumvents. So there are this interplay of complex ions which people are made with in drinking water, and that's what actually regulates the intake of uranium and before it is actually getting expelled out of the body through urine or so what what is the intake of urinary um, a uranium concentration together with drinking water concentration but i think this group from medical hydrogeology group they were also looking into the uranium urinary chloride levels and sodium levels as compared to the how you really compare and benchmark the para different parameters. So I think we are still not there, but it's an ongoing process which should be really taken up with this new science discipline in medical hydrogeology. This is mm. Hawk is working on this. Uh, Actually, so in India, we have, uh, um, I mean, uh, uranium has emerged as a, I mean, third healer, uh, arsenic chloride and uh, uranium. I mean, the in, if I would say micro pollutant, uh, yeah. micro geo pollutant. Uh, so in that case, uh, Indian government is running one of the national, uh, I mean, the mission on this uh, to understand the uranium distribution in India. Uh, like uh, Abhijit has told that play, the plate tectonics is playing a lot of role. And uh, this uranium is almost behaving like a, uh, like, you know, that oxy ions of arsenic and same thing is oxy ion of uranium and like that. So it, it can occur in the dissolved form, non-dissolved form, and uh, it is uh, several times. I mean, uh, my, I, I think from India, I am the first one who wrote the coexistence about arsenic chloride and uranium uh, coexisting in the floodplains, and we published it. Um, and I wanted to uh, explore further, but I moved on. So anyway, uh, so these things, uranium is uh, certainly is one of the geogenic contaminants. Uh, if I may just add a very small point. Um, so the places where you see the uranium, again, they're linked to the rocks. You know, all of these contaminants that we're ever talking about, they are actually dependent on the rocks and the reactions that would mobilize the contaminants from the rocks. And uranium specifically would exist in the groundwater system as uranate and oxyanion. And these oxyanions, they actually co get collaborated with other oxyanions like molybdate and vanadate and selenate. So if you have the right reactions taking place and you have the right source rocks, you will get uranium in your system. And that's why in, you know, if we go for the Indian context, in the Western parts of India, in, the, in Rajasthan, in Gujarat, you have uranium in the groundwater system. The reason being that these regions are, you know, hosting some of the oldest rocks, like what you call cretans, And these rocks are known to have uranium in their, in their structure. So you, when you get the right reactions happening in the right place, you have the uranium along with these I'm other contaminants coming out. Isn't what okay. for so, uh, uranium. Sorry, did you wanna add to that, Dr. Saha? Yeah, uh, then uh, Dr. Avijit, then what can be the high reason for high uranium in Punjab and Haryana? Um, again, like, uh, do you know like whether they are not coming from the fertilizer? I'm I'm not sure, but uranium. If you see Pan India, mm -hmm. the uranium data, high uranium values, they are coming from those areas where already some contaminants are there. They are not coming from the pristine area. I mean to I mean to say that where no other contaminants are there, and suddenly uranium has emerged. No, no, they would not. They would yeah, not. That is my observation. Exist. Sure, I, I absolutely agree with you. And if through fertilizer, if it comes, then if you see the the yeah, rate of uh, the say 
uh, use of fertilizer may, in this year, the MP Madhya Pradesh has exceeded the fertilizer use of Punjab and also the production of wheat. So there should be... Uh, no, I, I'm not saying that you yes, know, it, it has come from fertilizer, but that's a possibility because you know, when you, you, uh, you know, develop for, uh, phosphate fertilizer, the phosphate fertilizer you know, in the ionic structure, they get uranate in, in their, in their you know, uh, crystal structure. Again, depending on what kind of fertilizer you are using, there is a possibility that it would introduce uranium into the system. Yeah, it can. Central I, I, I'll just, states are I'll just give you one huge. example. Just one example. You know, like again, going back to the states, um, in the in the southern US, there is a huge arsenic problem. Now that arsenic mm -hmm. problem for a long time was thought to be geogenic, but later on, you know, I was also a part of that research group uh, where Bridges Scanlan and others were working. We found out it was not actually geogenic, neither what was industrial, rather it was coming from the pesticides or insecticides that people were using for cotton farming. There is also a hypothesis for India that some of the arsenic might be a remnant of the indigo cultivation that used to happen during the colonial time. So some oh, kind of, yeah. yeah. I have a question, what, did you, what, what was the level of arsenic, uranium you're actually encountering? Both Where? to the Pungarda in in um, in Rajasthan in Punjab. You see, of uh, 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 I cannot tell you the in Punjab it is no. even highest than uh, Gujarat in some parts. So, so the drinking uh, they are exceeding the drinking water guideline for thirty. Yeah, yeah, of course. The I mean it's the the, the first first project started uh, from Punjab when the people started complaining about it. And uh, then, of course, uh, the Ben Gose has published in Gujarat uh, when he like followed the Vijit uh, plate tectonics. So, of course, uh, there should be rock source for sure. But uh, so of that, course, like, naturally, Abhijit, yes. Abhijit himself has told that there is a two key factors. One is, uh, of course, geogenic. Yeah, another is that trig is anthropogenic there. triggering. So that is there. Yeah. So geogenic, we have this massive rhyolite, Bayani uh, rhyolite, and all those, the whole Western Indian Aravali mountain chains. So from where part of these so sediment oh. provenance is going to but lead the, into such groundwater ground flow direction is from Himalaya. So, so let Pakistan. moderator be moderating. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Otherwise> Anyhow, <laughs> it's really, really it's exciting, exciting yeah, discussion yeah, yeah. here, I can see. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, I know it's late in the day for you guys, so yeah. maybe in that sense we need to bring it to a close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, otherwise, many people will miss their uh, dinner in their hostels. Uh, so, David, uh, please go ahead. Well, I'll pass on to you to say some final words for today. I don't know. Is, is that what uh, you had in mind? Um, I would uh, ask some of the questions from you on your presentation of the real world sustainability tomorrow. Um, and uh, the, because, uh, of course, I can catch you any time because you are going to be here uh, the, in all three days. Uh, so actually, uh, the end was that uh, supposed to be uh, that uh, through Falguni. But first of all, I would like to thank Falguni because uh, without her, it would have been impossible to organize at such a, such a short notice. So Falguni, please thank all, including me, and finish it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Professor Manish. Uh, so I think it was a really wonderful uh, session today, all the sessions. Uh, I'll, um, uh, I'm very sure that all the participants must have, uh, you know, benefited from this wonderful discussions that we had in all the sessions of the conference today. And uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers of all the se four sessions we had today. Uh, including those who may have left by now. And uh, especially uh, a very special thanks to uh, all the speakers of the session, uh, Geogenic Concerns and um, uh, Environmental Engineering Solutions, uh, COVID-19. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor David and Professor Manish who are the conveners of this conference. And uh, I'm very sure that I think we have been, uh, we have been quite successful today and uh, we hope so for the next two days. And uh, I would also like to thank Professor Binoy Sarkar who is there with us uh, today among the panelists. 
and uh, I'd like to thank the all the team members, including the communication team and the IT team and all the other team members who uh, worked with us throughout the organizing part of this event. And um, uh, okay, so I think uh, that is all. Thank you one and all. And I'd hand over to Professor just, just one thing is that uh, please circulate this uh, to among your students because mm -hmm. uh, this time we are trying to uh, make it very crisp and uh, still trying to get a lot of out of it. Uh, I think uh, today uh, it was proved that uh, a experienced person like Dipankar Saha doesn't need to be presenting with slides. He is doing best when he doesn't present with the slides. And this time I forced him not to present with slides. So the uh, and he did a great job. Uh, I enjoyed it thoroughly, uh, Dr. Saha. Uh, Abhijit is always, of course. Uh, mm, the, I try to. I am trying to come uh, near to him, but uh, uh, the <laughs> and person does dream and energy is never ending. Uh, we have some of the uh, team, so I would ask you to please come for concluding uh, session day after tomorrow. Uh, Professor uh, Dr. B. M. Tibari will be giving the concluding remarks, and we are passing this information to them that what we have uh, concluded. In COVID, there were very surprising uh, conclusions were made, and even for me, it was very interesting and uh, mesmerizing. So, thank you very much. See you tomorrow. Uh, I mean, please circulate the, these things, and so that many many people can be benefited. Stay safe, all of you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.